Thank you very much, Moore. I'm flattered. Thank you. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. I know there's a wealth of presentations going on right now, and you've chosen to be here. So thank you very much for your participation. So just to add a little bit to my background so you can kind of make sense of why I'm here, um, Moore mentioned that my dissertation research took place in Tanzania. So that places me very accurately as an East Africanist. And I'm always very interested in what's happening on the continent. And especially since my research was neighboring to Rwanda, I've continued in that particular vein as a personal and side interest. Uh, my job focuses on community colleges here in the US. So I don't really get an opportunity to go off tangents and do any sort of international work professionally. So this is actually a side project that I'm working on. And so just a caveat, I hesitate to call it research at this stage. Right now, I'm just calling it an inquiry. So, so what this is looking at is how Rwanda is starting to embrace higher education expansion through using MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. So to frame this, this is in three parts. First of all, I want to introduce you to Rwanda for those who may not be familiar with, with this country and its history. Then I want to tap into your knowledge of MOOCs so you have an understanding of what type of technology that they are embracing. And then I'm going to review the model that they have just started to implement. And when I say they, it's a very, very small subsection. This is a pilot program that they are running. So, and then at the end, we're going to tie all three sections together, and I welcome you all to a robust discussion on your opinions on what's going on here. So first, our introduction of Rwanda. Okay. Many of you may know of it because its history has been the forefront of the news over the past 20 years, unfortunately, due to the unfortunate um, happenings in 1994, which we'll get to in a few minutes. A few of the statistics to keep in mind, and I won't read these slides, I'll just use these as backgrounds, but I'll pull out some highlights. Let's keep in mind that Rwanda is a small country, as you saw in the map, it's landlocked. It is a very poor country with a large percentage living under $2 a day and also a fairly large percentage living under $1.25 a day. So it's a small country with a, re a medium sized population, which is by far and large very poor. It is also a very young country. So let's keep in mind, in terms of its age pyramid, look where it's concentrated. The majority of Rwandans are fairly young. And a very large percentage fall within the college age bracket. So let's just keep that in mind in terms of how large that population is. In terms of what I'm going to show you within the next few slides, their access to higher education. Now the field from which I come, international educational development, it's always very important for us to contextualize the history and the culture of the country before we consider any sort of educational innovation. So I present this to you now. And I know I don't have a whole lot of time to explain its history and culture, but a very large component of that would be the genocides. And I do pluralize that because Rwanda just didn't have its genocide in 1994. There was a predecessor in 1959. So these ethnic clashes have been continuing for decades in Rwanda. And they happened to come to a major head in 1994, where almost a million people lost their lives in a very short span of time. Just to point out some of the changes, if you take a look, I wasn't able to get um, statistics from 1994, but the genocide was basically orchestrated by the majority Hutus against the minority Tutsis. And as you can see, over the past 20 years, and we're coming up on the 20th anniversary in just a few months, in April, you can see that changing population where the Tutsis were in 1995, a year after the genocide, and how their population is starting to recover from that 20 years later. So that's going to have an impact on educational delivery. 
The genocide also had a major impact on how the economy ev ev developed from those 20 years. Families were devastated. So you have a lot of college educate, well, I'm, I'm sorry, college age students today who grew up as orphans and vulnerable children, heads of households. These households were also devastated by AIDS, which was also at the time used as a weapon of war, as Hutus also incorporated in the, in the genocide rape as part of their aggression against the Tutsi people. Of course, all of this has led to widespread poverty, as you saw in the earlier statistics. And to add to that, since 1994, the country has had a moratorium on a national history curriculum. It doesn't mean that they're not learning about history, such as natural history or, or other forms of history, but since, two, since 1994, they have not been formally speaking about the genocide. So all of this is, you know, plays a big part of the background of what is happening in Rwanda. And on top of that, they also have a large mistrust of the international community. And that stems from the international community's reactions to what took place in 1994. If you recall, not a whole lot of countries, especially the westernized, westernized world, came to the immediate aid of Rwanda. And the international community uh, received a lot of criticism for that. But that still did not repair the damage. And so that is still in the background. So that kind of gives you a little bit of history and context of where the Rwandans are coming from. So this is the current educational structure of Rwanda. They pretty much follow the British educational system. They do have pre-primary education. They do have a primary education tier that covers children between 7 and 12 years of age. They do have two different tiers for secondary education much like other East African countries. Then for their higher education, you can partition it into vocational training, which is very similar to what I experienced in Tanzania, and also tertiary education, which they also term higher learning institution. Now, despite all of those multiple tiers, which appear to be pretty full and representative of most students in the country, in terms of percentage, as you can see from this chart, there are very few students who are accessing higher education in Rwanda. And that would be that pink sliver, about 2.4% of the population. These are statistics from 2011. And that represents over 3 million students. Also keep in mind when you saw those, those age brackets and we focused on how young the country is, for that particular population that was specifically college age, that was 1.9 million, again, that represents a very tiny percentage of the population that has accessed a college education. And this shows the total numbers of college students in 2011. Just a little over 70,000 students. Again, that's a very small population. That's pretty much a very large U of I representing every single college student in Rwanda. That's not a lot. Things are changing very quickly in Rwanda. Prior to 2013, they had 31 higher learning institutions. 17 were public and 14 are private. That's an important distinction because it's very difficult to get into a public school. It's easier to get into a private school. However, private schools come at a larger cost. And especially, the cost extends to the subjects that you study. The private schools tend to have a larger concentration in liberal arts and studies. And that happens to be where the majority of female enrollments end up. So in terms of access, it also spreads to you know, a gender-based access question. Whereas if most of the female students are being channeled into private institutions, they're also being channeled into um, the LAS subjects as opposed to the STEM subjects. Now as of 20, fall 2013, 
This entire environment is changing. Rwanda has just, in, within the past semester, merged all of their public universities together into one university with six separate colleges. So a lot is happening right now. Uh, very, very nascent information coming out of that, but it'll be interesting to see how that develops and grows and impacts access. But we know that's not the full story. According to the Ministry of Education in Rwanda, these are their main challenges for higher education. Of course, access and retention. There's a very large amount of demand. As you saw, 77% of over 3 million students were in primary education. Those students have to go somewhere. So as the pipeline narrows and there's less and less places for those students to enter, that means less and less students have access to higher education. So that's a major problem that they're trying to deal with. And that's not unique to Rwanda. East African countries, by and large, tend to have that access problem, especially once primary education became universal. Quality is also a very big concern. They lost a lot of their intellectual population during the genocide, and so it's been a challenge to make sure that those teachers have been replenished, and also retaining those teachers. Teacher pay in East Africa has, is no notoriously low, and there have been a very high amount of teacher dissatisfaction with the with the uh, profession. So again, retain, retaining the teaching faculty has been a challenge. Relevance of the education. This is very interesting because we can find this same terminology in, in US systems, where it's very critical today to make sure that the education that students are receiving in the classroom is relevant to the outside world and allows them a pathway to employment. So the Rwandans have recognized that and are trying to facilitate those partnerships to inform education and employment so that those linkages are stronger. And then, of course, cost. Higher education comes at a great cost. And unfortunately, for a poor country like Rwanda, it's a very high challenge to be able to afford that. So they have uh, multiple priorities within their uh, five-year learning plan or, or education strategic plan. And I've pulled out two that are very relevant for what we're going to talk about next. First of all, is it's that relevance piece. It's making sure that their educational system, especially higher education, is being tailored to meet the needs of employers in the area. The education is high quality and also relevant so that when students come out, they can have jobs. Also, note that they are making linkages to technology, e-learning, open distance learning. So they are embracing all of these new technological innovations that are coming forth in the education sector. And they're starting to implement those within their higher education tiers. So my question of inquiry at this point is how can Rwanda utilize those technological innovations to improve access to students who want higher education so that 2.4% can grow and affect a larger percentage of those students who demand higher education. So at this point, now that you have a, a better understanding of the background of Rwanda and where the students are coming from, we're going to segue into the technological point, portion, which is going to cover MOOCs. And this is a graphic that I've adopted by Matthew Plourd. I, I do like it very much because MOOC is really up into our interpretation, isn't it? It's massive, open, online course. But each of these letters can have multiple meanings. There is no standardization for what a MOOC is. Let's explore that a little bit further. First of all, massive. How do you define massive? There are courses that have as few as 100 students, some that have over 300,000. These are meant to be scaled. They're meant to be course-based. Um, 
ex accessible education units that can be scaled to reach multiple, many, many people all over the world. For example, one of the very first MOOCs, at first it was only attended by 175 people and that quickly grew to over 160,000 students all over the world. So there is massive reach and massive potential for MOOCs. Open, again, a wide variety of interpretations on what that means. Access, many MOOCs have unrestricted access to their courses. Content, a lot of this content is freely available from some of the most prestigious universities in the entire world. They're, they can also be considered open in regards to cost. Most MOOCs are free of charge. And taking a look at this next slide, we'll show you a little bit of a graph in terms of where some of the major MOOCs fall. Because we do have to be careful when we say MOOCs are free. Content is generally free, as you can see here. But when it comes to accessing credits or certifications, there is generally a charge attached to that. And even though those charges are fairly small, for example, one of the MOOCs charges $100 to get a certificate of completion, still that's a lot of money for someone in a poor country like Rwanda to pay. So again, something to keep in mind in terms of limitations that might pop up in regards to this technology. Online. All MOOCs are online. Gives us a lot of advantages, a lot of benefits. You can access it from any computer at any time all over the world. And a lot of the universities and organizations which offer MOOCs also claim that it's real-time interaction. You have chat rooms where you can facilitate discussions with your professors and your fellow students. You can take a test to figure out where you stand in that particular course and get immediate feedback for your progress. You also have access to students worldwide. And of course, something that the U of I really likes is a huge database of students from which to collect data. So there are lots of advantages to MOOCs in terms of it being online. And the range and flexibility within the courses, again, you cannot standardize this. Some of the courses are just a week, some span a year. They have different pedagogies and andragogies in terms of their delivery. And there's a wide range of subjects. You can study just about anything you would like. Of course, quality is always a question. But if you are interested, you can always look for ET online and learn about ET or how to build a startup company. So now we know a little bit about MOOCs and we're thinking about the potential they have for expanding access because they're so massive, because they are open, because they are online, and because there are flexibility in, in their courses. Well, what's really happening? If you take a look at the participants and you take a look at those from what are considered the developing countries, their participation is very low. Only 9% of edX learners are from Africa. And most users currently of MOOCs happen to already have a higher level of education. So pictures of participants are coming out where the participants tend to be from the richer countries, they tend to be more highly educated, and they tend not to be doing it for credit. And this comes out in the pros and the cons. Okay? We understand what some of the pros are because we've already discussed those in the previous slides. But what are some of the critiques? Some of these MOOCs have been claimed to be just too large. They're impersonal. You can't really get someone face to face to explain the subject matter and enhance the learning experience. And of course, we already discussed they're not always free. They're not always open. Again, you have to evaluate each MOOC course as it comes along on its own merits. It also assumes that the user has uh, reliable access to the internet and the computer. I can tell you from my own personal experience living in Tanzania, that's not always the case. Even if you do have a computer, you don't always have access to the internet. So again, reflecting on access for students in Rwanda, that's something to keep in mind. And of course, quality is an issue. 
And another th huge critique of MOOCs is the low level of completion and certificates at this current point in time. However, as we just discussed, <laughs> Most of the students who are going online for these courses are not necessarily in it to complete or to get a certificate. Okay, that might change, but it's something to keep in mind. So how does that affect access? Okay, as we saw, the majority of the countries and participants that are utilizing MOOCs are the richer countries, more educated population, and you know, in places like China, there's even regulation against students getting into MOOCs because of some of the regulations that they have. But again, in terms of what MOOCs are designed to do, according to the critiques, they don't seem to be reaching the populations that the inventors of MOOCs originally envisioned. And you can see this in the next slide. Here are some of the, the professors who started the very first MOOCs. And as you can see in their statements, they really have an access focus. They see MOOCs as a way to bring education to people all over the world. They think about a MOOC as breaking down barriers, not erecting barriers. So you have a little bit of conflict in terms of what the vision for a MOOC is and what's actually happening on the ground, which of course we know from its vast capacity to collect data from the students that it's collecting data on. doesn't mean that MOOCs are a bad thing. It just means we have to keep it in perspective what their capabilities are and what their reach is. So now let's have two inquiries at this point. Of course, this is the original inquiry asking, can Rwanda utilize technology to improve access to higher education? And then, now knowing what we now know about MOOCs, can MOOCs play a part in expanding that access? And here comes the third segue. The Kepler model. This is something new and to me it's actually very exciting. This is at this point in time a pilot project that is launched by the Kepler Foundation in New York City. And what they are doing is they are launching a model that blends online in online courses, such as MOOC-based courses, with in-person learning facilitation, as well as workplace learning. The reason why I like this model is because if you recall some of the things that Rwanda wanted in terms of making their education more higher quality and more relevant to the workplace, they're considering that within their model. They're networking with businesses to make sure that students are getting internships and they're connecting with businesses to make sure that the information they're getting in the classroom is relevant to the potential jobs that they might have outside of the classroom. Also, with their in-person seminars, yes, they're using MOOCs for most of their content, but one of the critiques of MOOCs was that they're too big, they're too impersonal, and that there's, there's a very low completion rate well, what Kepler is doing is they're using on-the-ground, on-site facilitators to help guide students to the proper courses, to help lead discussions around those courses, to help with grading, to help with organization, to help with motivation. And as we know from the literature, having someone in the classroom as a support person, as someone to facilitate learning, helps to encourage retention in the course and completion of that course. So on paper, to me this looks like a very powerful model as it's, a, it, as it's utilizing two additional facets to enhance the usage of MOOCs in Rwanda. But of course this is just on paper. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Kepler is keeping in mind the fact that this information, this courseware, needs to be relevant to those students in Rwanda, and it needs to be relevant to those businesses into which they will eventually find jobs. They are also interested in conducting research in terms of how successful this model is going to be. 
This model was launched at the same time that the University of Rwanda consolidated its higher education tiers into one university and six colleges. So again, a lot is happening on the ground. But this is very outcomes based, which probably calls to mind a very US centric model. Again, they're based in New York. They're focusing on outcomes. How does the curriculum impact those outcomes? And how are they going to learn to facilitate those outcomes? And then, of course, they're a business. Let's keep that in mind, too. They not only want this to happen in Rwanda, but they're thinking of scaling this up. Kenya is the next country on their list that they're considering. So they're looking at this model as not only bringing access to underserved students in Rwanda, but underserved students at this point in time in Africa, starting with Kenya and moving above and beyond. And a huge part of that model is a very low tuition rate, which we'll discuss in just a few minutes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in my field, any educational innovation needs to be contextualized to the country in which it's going to be based. It's very important to do that because I'm sure you have all studied countries and in educational innovations that have failed because people did not consider a language barrier, they didn't consider a cultural context, or they just didn't understand you know, what the needs of the people are. So they're partnering with another organization called Generation R Rwanda, which has 10 years of experience in Rwanda delivering educational scholarships. I don't necessarily think that this is a perfect solution for them. Again, this is a nascent program, so we have yet to see exactly how successful they're going to be, but at least they're moving in the right direction in terms of partnering with an agency which has experience with the historical and the cultural context in which they're about to operate. But that doesn't mean that more can't be done. Now, in terms of the model that they're using to drive their curriculum, they're looking for their students to be competent, analytical, and expert. Again, I find this to be a very US-centric model based on outcomes, competency, and basic skills. Open any newspaper on a given day in the US, and you will always find employers complaining about you know, potential employees not being competent in basic skills, not having critical thinking and reasoning skills. So again, it's a very US-centric model that they're using. But again, as it's a pilot program and we don't yet know what the outcomes are, as long as they are utilizing a Rwanda focus and contextualizing it to the Rwandan context, this is something that could potentially work. This is more the nitty gritty of the activities that the students are engaged in. So it gives you an idea of what their daily learning experience is like. They're sitting in on the MOOCs, they're streaming the lectures. The lectures are being facilitated by people on the ground. So they're keeping the students focused in real time and allowing them to engage more actively and attentively with the materials. And then the students are also living together in academic communities so they, they can mutually reinforce their learning and academic experience. And then they're connecting with businesses in the area to make sure that the learning is relevant and that there are jobs waiting for these students when they come out. And a lot of that's being facilitated by internships. And as I mentioned, this comes at a very low cost. As we all know, University education around the world is incredibly expensive. A tuition rate of $1,200, especially from my perspective being here in the US, is not that expensive. Of course, you take that to a Rwandan context and that still is very, very expensive. Very cost prohibitive, even if 
um, well, you know, keep, keep in, mi in mind a large percentage of the population makes less than $2 a day or even less than $1.25 a day. Yet that's still pretty impressive. And one of the reasons that they can keep the cost so low is the content is by and large free. Kepler is designing a portion of the curriculum, but for a lot of this university curriculum that's going into the associate's degree that these students will learn and eventually the bachelor's degrees comes from universities like U of I where it's free and open, and then facilitated by somebody on the ground. So that's how they're keeping costs low. There's very minimal staffing that goes into this higher education model. They're utilizing most free, uh, mo most of it is free technology. But still, it's a high price to pay. So uh, that tweaks in my mind that, you know, again, open access, we still need to problematize that. So we talked about barriers a little bit earlier, and we're, we're, we're coming up to the end of the presentation here. We mentioned that in developing countries, oftentimes it's, a, it's very difficult to get access to the internet, difficult to get access to you know, any sort of, of, of Wi-Fi. But Rwanda did just complete a very, very large optic network project that does connect even the most remote villages to internet. So it's not to say that the barriers are limited and eliminated, but it's a barrier that's being actively addressed. In terms of other barriers that we saw within MOOCs, we saw that MOOCs were very accessible, but one of the problems was that, you know, you can enter a MOOC as an individual student, and then you're amongst 120,000 other students, and you can feel lost. Kepler is providing structure and accessibility to that. So they're, they're a navigational tool that allows students to integrate within the MOOC, but as a smaller learning body within a cohort of students with whom they are living and working with. So that MOOC now becomes personalized. Again, it's not a barrier that's eliminated, but it's a barrier that's being addressed. And of course, the on-site facilitators are making sure that that process happens with that point person to make that educational experience more relevant. And we have found in the literature that having that support person there does enhance completion rates and retention rates. Yet there are still challenges. As I mentioned earlier on, access to, is still an issue because there are only 50 students in this pilot program. We saw a lot more students needing access. And right now, Kepler is is not ready to accommodate, even within the next couple years, they're not ready to accommodate, you know, the hundreds of thousands of students, the millions of students who are eventually going to want higher education in Rwanda. So access is still an issue. As I mentioned, cost is still an issue. $1,200 is a lot of money for your average Rwandan, especially for someone who grew up without parents, someone who is the head of their household because there are no parents or they're aid, AIDS orphans. And in terms of equitable access, I think the jury is still out on who is being serviced by this education. For those 50 spots in the pilot program, Kepler received thousands of applications. So that basically meant through their processes, they picked the best and the brightest students to succeed in this program. So. Again, if you're a very poor student in a remote village in Rwanda, your chances of getting into this program are probably reduced if you didn't have the same exposure to some of the advantages that um, the students who were able to test into the program received. And sustainability, of course, is another question. Is this something that they can really sustain and grow? Of course, the program is in its very nascent stages, and that remains to be seen. But it is a concern if this is something that they're going to take on full-fledged. Now, as I mentioned, Kepler is doing research on this themselves. They are, they are doing randomized testing. They are taking a look at a sample of traditional Rwan um, students in, in Rwandan universities and also students who have access to MOOCs but without a facilitator. And they're going to compare outcomes. That way they can decide whether the unique aspects of their model create value to the overall system. 
And that brings us back to our original questions. Now that you know a little bit more about Rwanda and what their needs are in terms of higher education, and now that you know a little bit more about MOOCs, what the pros of MOOCs are and the cons, what potential they have and what pitfalls they have, and now that you also know about this newer model that they're piloting, that tries to you know, build up those pros, you know, take on all those benefits, but minimize those disadvantages. How can Rwanda utilize technology to expand access for its higher education students? And do MOOCs possess the potential to eliminate the barriers? Or are we only going to see more exacerbation of inequities that we currently see in the system? And that is what I leave you with for discussion. First, thank you. It's a great presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Second, something for the whole group. We have pizza in the back. If you want to take a slide, this is not the moment for the rest, so I want to mention that. And now some comments about, uh, comments and questions about the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I wonder is how is the government in Rwanda is seeing this Kepler mm -hmm. company and how they are facilitating to install this project. Uh, what is the role that they have in this? Do they, they see this, the, what we have to do? Mm -hmm. And also I'm wondering what is the stand of the also Rwanda government about higher education? Do they think mm -hmm. that they have to build more universities? Is that a, a goal that is achievable at some point? Or is MOOCs the, the, the answer that they foresee for in the future maybe a start to develop knowledge? Because mm -hmm. this issue of who is producing the knowledge can also in a long term put you in a dependency role. Like, oh, they are the ones who are producing the knowledge, it's free. But mm -hmm. they are the ones who are talking, we just have to listen. So if they are willing in some point to have that role also being the productive of knowledge, uh, the development of professors in mm -hmm. So that's the question that I have about your presentation. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and I have not seen in, in the inquiries that I've made an official statement from the Rwandan government about this model. So I haven't seen it in a newspaper or newsprint. What they're concentrating more on, according to what I've seen, is the consolidation of their universities. And they're doing that to streamline the universities and make it more cost efficient for them to run the university. So as, as opposed to managing 17 individual schools and colleges, they're now managing one university. So my guess, and it's just an educated guess based upon what I've read in terms of their strategic plan, is that they're looking at Kepler, if they're looking at all, as a private education delivery system that does not stand in competition with the university and however they can increase access for the students that they cannot accommodate, they're probably willing to let that happen. And, and unopposed at this point in time. Especially since you're not taking any jobs from Rwandans at this point in time. It's, it's not like you know, you're bringing in a whole host of you know, foreign teachers to take over teaching jobs in the country. You have in-person facilitators, which are largely from the West, but they do have a training plan in place to train Rwandan facilitators. So there is an active plan to make sure that this becomes a more of a Rwandan business than something that's based in the US and is still US-centric in accordance with what I read. But that may change. Again, this is only a 50-person pilot at this point in time. So my guess is, in terms of what Rwanda has to deal with as a whole, it's a blip on their radar. If they're smart, though, they're, they have somebody looking at it, though, especially since they're using MOOC technology, and especially since they want to move themselves into you know, exploring those options for their own higher education institutions, as defined in their education sector plan. So I don't think they're blind to it. I just don't think they're reacting to it yet. So, but that's a good question. It's something to, to watch out 
definitely watch out for. Yes. In terms of logistics, uh, how does this work on the ground? Are there certain Kepler centers where students have to go to if they're having difficulty accessing at their homes? Um, how is it sort of built on the ground? It's in Kigali, and the students actually all live together. Okay, it's a living learning type community. Right. Right. So as far as I know, they have, um, Kepler is a fairly lean organization, even in New York City. So they have one person, like one person that's, you know, a, the academic director is on the ground in Kigali, and then there's a lead facilitator who's also on the ground in Kigali. And then they also have some of the, you know, class facilitators. But it's very lean. I, don't know how many in-class facilitators they have. They didn't, there's no, um, uh, there's nothing on their website to explain exactly how many people are on the ground, but that's fairly lean. And the tuition is covering those 50 students in terms of their living, their day-to-day -day expenses and their housing. So it's not, a, it's, it's not to say that there aren't students outside who are not, who can't access. So if they go home, you know, I guess, and they're visiting in the village, do they have access to the Kepler materials, that I don't know. I don't know if that's a challenge, but I know that you know Kepler feels comfortable in terms of the Wi-Fi that's been provided through the large optic cables that have been laid. So, but they're basing it mostly on site in their facility in Kigali. I don't know if that'll change in the future, though. One would think it would have to if they're going to scale it to thousands of people, because that it calls for more brick and mortar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. and I was just curious as to what are the demographics of the students who are chosen, how they get chosen to participate in this particular program. Okay. There were only 50 students chosen out of thousands of applicants. And there were Kepler facilitators on site who were, you know, they first screened the applications. Of course, you had to have certain academic credentials. Then you had to go through an entire application process, which I'm not privy to. And then they had on-site interviews with students. So I, I'm not saying that the students were cherry-picked, but it makes me inclined to think that because they had such access to the best and brightest minds, just by going through the application process alone, it means they had a access to technology they had access to internet. They had access, they, they had completed their secondary education, which, you know, in these African countries, that's still a challenge. So again, my question is, is equity really being served? Again, it's a pilot, it's only 50 people, so maybe that question shouldn't even be asked yet. But I don't necessarily think that should be the way going forward. In terms, if they want to reach thousands of students and if they want this to be equitable, they also need to expand this process to those who may not have those advantages, who may have the talents, but not the advantages. I mean, one of the amazing things about MOOCs is that MOOCs have teased out some amazing scholars in some incredibly remote places. There was the incidents of um, one student in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia took like a circuits and circuitry course uh, through MIT online, aced it 100% on the final exam. He was 15. Guess where he is now? He's at MIT. It's also a recruiting tool. These universities aren't dumb. They know some of these students don't necessarily have access, you know, through the application process. I mean, especially if you're charging for an application. You have to pay $100 to apply to us. Well, my father brings home a dollar a day. I, I can't come up with that. But you take a free online MOOC, you prove to them you have the merits. All of a sudden, the student is no longer in Ulaanbaatar. He's in Cambridge, Massachusetts, studying with the best and brightest in the world. So the MOOCs have that potential. I just don't think it's fully unlocked yet. It's just not accessible enough to everyone. Again, there's still, I mean, the student still had access to the internet. You know, still, even though he, was, he may not have ever gone to college in Mongolia, he still had something, some other advantage that allowed him to be noticed. 
not denying his talents at all. But this happens worldwide, and there are more and more of these wonderful, heartwarming stories that you hear. Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, very nice insight, not only from you, but from the question. From yeah, they're, they're great questions. Questions that Kepler should know. That's very true. <laughs> and I think uh, a lot of things going on in the presentation, which I think all of are important, particularly if we want to consider them to go into the future, since this is just a pilot project. And I think there's one thing maybe the government of Rwanda or Rwandans itself we might be able to check, and I think they probably have been, is the gap between quality and higher access. And how mm. will they try to make sure that they still can guarantee a quality of education, but also right. going through the quality that will not, you know, let a lot of people aside. Because when you talk about quality, you talk about prior access, because they had prior access people within that quality. And if you mm -hmm. don't pay attention to prior access, then the future access is just going to be uh, it's more and more. No, that's, that's such an important comment, because you're right, if 50 students, again, for facilitators, some of, these some of these facilitators are coming from the West, they're looking at a year in Rwanda, I can get great experience as a teacher, so I can imagine that they were able to get you know, a pretty fine cadre of facilitators going into the field. So what remains to be seen is you know, the training program that they have when they start to switch that from students in the West to Rwandan facilitators, you know, t to be able to train facilitators to that level of quality and to grow that so that there's quality as they start to train instead of 50 students, thousands of students. And then of course the larger it grows, then there's also another question of quality throughout the um, Rwandan education system period. Because if Kepler becomes a very popular program, and if it offers a better pay and higher prestige than the Rwandan education system does, you're going to start cherry picking teachers out. And then quality in, say, secondary schools or you know, some of the private institutions in Rwanda, you know, that might be out of balance. So there, there, there's some very interesting questions, very interesting things that are going to start happening. And I hope this works. I mean, I don't work for Kepler. I've never met anybody from Kepler, <laughs> but I'm rooting for them because I think that they've found some unique ways to plug in the holes that have been identified with MOOCs. I don't know if they're doing a really good job of contextualizing the education to the Rwandan experience. Of course, you have to keep in mind you know, their whole history. I don't know what they're doing. I didn't see a history course on their curriculum, so I don't know what's happening there. But it seems like they have some knowledge on how to move forward with that by partnering with Generation Rwanda. They just didn't say, OK, let's pick Rwanda and do this pilot. They partnered with someone who had some experience. Again, I don't know how well that's working. If in order for us to really find out, we'd have to talk with the students, which means an IRB that I don't have <laughs> yet. <laughs> And I think he's willing to put a lot of money not on the, the reduction of the uh, of the numeric divide, but also making sure that the connection between the end of uh, uh, <coughs> secondary education to college education mm -hmm. actually goes a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how his own aim to make that change in the local city will try to match up his own cooperation with international educational uh, mm -hmm. schools or the Mm -hmm. And I think you, you gave a very important point is how at a local level will Generation Rwanda and the official you know, structures of the Rwandan community and society will try to take the best for moves and kept them mm -hmm. so that higher education access at the local level is actually much more the quality they need to try. Right. Right, because that's, that's going to be key, <coughs> especially since businesses are, I, I, don't know, I don't know which businesses. You know, I don't know who they're speaking to. It would be really interesting to sit down with Kepler in New York City, as long as it's not snowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and find out, you know, who are they hiring? Who are the students? 
I mean, they do have a whole Facebook page, a, a very, very long Facebook history of these students, and you know, it's it's fairly engaging conversation. These 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 students are, you know, from what you read. Of course, you can only make a judgment based on Facebook. So, and if the internet's true, because everything on the internet's true, then it seems like these students are pretty top notch. But I don't know about their education. Of course, we would need a whole host of other factors to be able to evaluate that. And that would also be engaging the students themselves and helping with that particular evaluation. And then we don't know their outcomes. And we won't know their outcomes for at least another two years because you know, they're, they're first going to get an associates out of this. And then they haven't even built the bachelors yet. They're kind of you know, trying to remain a step ahead of themselves. But it'll be really interesting to see if this works. And by it working, it seems like Kepler defines employment as a huge outcome. If these students all graduate and all get jobs, I would say that worked. I'd like to see it work. I also have a little question. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with you that you know, what Kepler has been doing, starting to do is um, definitely great. And I can imagine like, any other project, it'll go for <coughs> you know, mm -hmm. different phases, hopefully improved and more mm -hmm. improved. But um, bringing it closer to one little point that you mentioned as far as the US-centric model mm -hmm. is, and how it's based on competences, uh, mm -hmm. analytics, and things of that mm -hmm. nature. What is your experience from Tanzania, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, considering also that it's in close proximity to Rwanda? Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining that in East Africa there are some similarities in educational models. What pillars is their model uh, based on, or w what are the goals of the educational system, broadly speaking, um, in comparison to this outcome-based mm -hmm. educational model? Um, I just want to get a sense of, you know, what is it like there? And um, I know that there is this um, invitation of, of local facilitators, which I think is really great, because mm -hmm. it allows for at least the beginning of that bridging, yes. and the beginning of contextualizing. I'm sure Kepler is learning a lot from them as well, mm -hmm. and their needs, I think. I would assume. Mm -hmm. And the, the assessment of the, the, the local education system uh, should be delved into further. But from your experience, I think the bottom line, my question is, what is the system based on you know, versus the outcomes based mm -hmm. uh, system that Kepler is bringing? Well, in terms of, I, I can speak more about the system in Tanzania sure. than I can in Rwanda because I have no field experience in Rwanda. It's only based on what I've, I've read. But Tanzania currently doesn't have a competency-based model. And they've been critiqued not because they don't have a competency-based model. They've been critiqued more because the education being provided supposedly isn't being matched to employment needs when they come out. And there's a whole host of critiques based on that, such as you know when the students go through in Tanzania, in terms of the language that they're being taught, the first you know six you know years of, of education are in Engl um, I'm sorry, are in Swahili. Mm -hmm. Then they, when they switch to secondary school, it automatically switches to English, because one of the critiques of local businesses trying to come into Tanzania was that, well, it seems like a business-friendly environment, but we don't have enough English speakers here. So they made that change, but it has been a very painful change because you just can't go you know, six, seven years of education. And, and I'm not even saying Swahili is their mother tongue. Most can Tanzanians have a mother tongue. Swahili is a national language because it's a trade-based language. So they come in bilingual anyways, but then all of a sudden they have to learn English in secondary school. And they're being taught by profess well, professors. I sh they do call them professor, but Mwalimu. But a lot of these teachers have the same type of education that their students had, and they don't even have their English speaking skills. So, and so that's one of the competencies on which Tanzania is being critiqued, is just the language itself, the language of business, <coughs> is not accessible to those who want to do business in the country. So I know that's something that Tanzania has been grappling with in terms of competency. And in terms of competency as, as a whole, one of Kepler's arguments is that 
they want the education to be more student driven. They don't want learning to be counted by seat time. Just because you sit in this seat week after week for two hours every week does not equate to the amount of learning that you've experienced. They want that to be proved by a competency. Now that, of course, we all know, you know, I'm not saying it originated in the US, but a lot of the most vociferous arguments for competency-based education originated here in the US and other westernized countries. As a lot of these businesses are saying, you're, you're sending us these students and they don't know how to be on time. They don't know how to dress properly. They don't know how to compose a proper letter. They don't know how to work in teams. Kepler's trying to address this. They have a course within the curriculum, within the two-year degree, that's just purely professionalization. So again, it's not a panacea, but, and, and again, I don't know how context contextualized it is to the Rwandan experience, because of course, you would have to talk with Rwandan businesses to find out what Rwandan businesses want. And I shouldn't just say businesses, Rwandan employers. You know, in order to see if this truly is, is relevant to what they're asking for. But in terms of competencies, that's Kepler's belief and some of the challenges that are being faced in East Africa. So I hope that kind of addresses your question. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.